It's a time of busyness, but a time of giving. And let us reflect and remember that the giving begins with you, that you are the great giver of all gifts. We thank you, Lord. Amen. Yeah, and this, um, this series that I've been teaching through the month of November, The Genius of Generosity, I got the idea from Chip Ingram. Chip Ingram is the pastor, I want to give credit where credit is due here. Chip Ingram is the pastor of Venture Church in Los Gatos, south of here. He's the leader of Living on the Edge, L-O-T-E, and he's got some great messages you can download uh, on the computer or buy the CDs. Anyway, and I got the idea particularly for this morning's message, The Ladder of Generosity, from uh, Chip. So I just want to, my wife insisted that I have to. But I have very few ideas. Most of my ideas I get from somebody else. But uh, I want to be honest here and let you know this. Um, the Christmas season, yeah, time of giving. 2 Corinthians 9.15, Paul writes, Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. The gift of Jesus, the gift of life, the gift of the eternal connection with God. All of that he's given to us. He's made us his children now and forever. This amazing gift that God has given to us. It begins, giving begins with God. And God shows us the genius of generosity. Those two words, genius and generosity, are connected. That is a Latin stem that means production, goodness, friendliness, um, the animals having lots of babies in the fields like our neighbor's sheep just gave birth to three little baby sheep and they're growing up. That's an example of the whole concept of genius generosity of God giving. These two words go together, the genius of generosity and why generosity is genius. And it begins with God and we copy God. We imitate God. He's generous to us and so we can be generous. We can afford to be generous with others. And so I want to look at the characters in the Christmas story, the account of the birth of Jesus Christ, our Lord, through the lens of generosity to see how that played out in each one of these. Starting out with the Magi in, this is in Matthew chapter 2, and you know the story, these wise men from the east, they were not Jewish, they were pagans, they were idol worshippers, but they saw a pattern in the stars. One time I was at the um, planetarium in San Francisco and they did a little take on how they figured it could have been that a particular combination of planets in the constellations would have indicated that a mighty king is born of the Jewish people. And so these people didn't know much about Judaism or the Jewish Messiah, but they made the long journey bringing gifts, precious, valuable, expensive gifts with them. They came to Jerusalem, uh, they figured they got to get there, and there they asked, they didn't know much, and the experts, the Bible scholars, the Jewish religious experts told them that the Messiah is going to be born in Bethlehem. And so they went to Bethlehem, and somehow the pattern of the stars showed them where to go. They'd studied the stars, and it was like a map that they'd read up there, and then they'd look and they'd say, okay, that means we've got to go here. So they knew from the pattern of the stars, and they found Jesus, and they gave him. They worshipped, and a big part of their worship was giving these precious gold and then frankincense, which was a very expensive incense that was imported from what's now Yemen in the Arabian Peninsula, and myrrh, another very costly spice, gave these to Joseph and Mary as a gift to the baby, giving precious stuff, which is a big deal, and it's a challenge, and I want to challenge you as we're filling in the pledge cards to just up the percentage a little bit this time around so that you can think about it. <clears throat> but <clears throat> it's just the beginning. Giving of stuff is the beginning of generosity. And there's a ladder of generosity that we're going to look at now that goes on from there. They got it. They gave of their precious things. Giving stuff, giving money is the beginning of generosity. On the way in Jerusalem, they ran into King Herod. King Herod was a completely different kind of king. King Herod was very rich, very powerful, very greedy, very cruel, totally unscrupulous. He <clears throat> was balancing the emperor and the power in Rome, the different factions of Jews in his own country, the neighboring countries which wouldn't have mind taking over, and keeping all of these with his wealth and his forces together. He killed his own sons because he was afraid they were 
rivals for his throne. Herod, of course, killed the little children in Bethlehem. Joseph was told to escape, and by the way, the gold and precious spices and incense that the wise men gave Joseph would have enabled them to escape to Egypt and start a new life there, which was very providential. Herod was the opposite. Not giving anything, just taking, ended up lonely and came to a sticky end. But the, the wise men were wise, they gave. They gave of their stuff, which is the beginning. And <clears throat> it is significant. <clears throat> when Patty and I lived in the woods in Mendocino, I was teaching, after I came to Christ, I was teaching Bible studies a lot. And one of the things I used to say is, <clears throat> the most spiritual thing is a unit of two by sixes and a 50 pound box of nails. Like praying, praying is important and good, and we need to pray. And singing worship songs and praising the Lord in song is a good and valuable thing. But what it really comes down to is the nitty gritty of helping each other out. We were all young families in this fellowship. We were raising our little children, trying to start a business or a career, and building our houses. And a unit of two by sixes and a box of nails is what it would take to frame up an addition to the house where the new addition to the family could stay and be warm and dry and safe. And so I used to say the most spiritual thing there is is a unit of two by sixes and a 50 pound box of nails because it's in giving of our substance to make a difference in people's lives, like through the faith promise giving to missions so we're reaching out around the world with the good news of Jesus making a difference. That's really the most spiritual. But we'll move up the ladder of uh, generosity, uh, the genius ladder of generosity. But I want to make another comment about um, a giving, giving of stuff. Uh, it's a story which I picked up on YouTube about Bishop Hannington Bahemuka in Uganda. Uh, he was uh, in a part of Uganda in the north where the country was torn apart by civil war. And thousands of Ugandans were driven out of their homes and out of their towns to live in a refugee camp. And it was really bad. Children would have to go two to three days without eating. The orphans didn't have food or clothes. And it was a desperate situation, and they didn't see how to get out of it. Bishop Hannington, as he was known, Hankin Bahamuka, had been taught everything comes from God, and God provides. As we saw in the reading that Karen just read about Abraham, on the mountain, God will provide. God provides. The Lord provides. And Hannington Bahamuka believed that, that the word resources there among the people and so he taught this principle of giving and the pastors who he led taught this principle of giving right in the refugee camp where people had nothing and they began by giving blankets to the orphans who had nothing and an orphan <coughs> said later on i knew it was god who gave me this blanket there were two years in the refugee camp where they practiced this principle of working together and giving and god blessed them and provided through this they went back to their home, <coughs> their, their hometown of Budibungyo, and found to be devastated in the war. The churches burned, the schools demolished, the homes burned. It was a time of great sorrow of spirit, almost despair. But Bishop Hannington, instead of saying, we need help from the West, said, we have the resources. We have mechanics. We have farmers. We have teachers here among us in our community. And so he encouraged people to give of their substance, of their time, to rebuild. And they rebuilt the city. One example, which is on the YouTube, is a woman who was crippled. And she didn't have a wheelchair or crutches. And so she would just sort of hobble along like this. She gave her only chicken to enable the rebuilding to take place. A chicken isn't much for us to give. But when it's the only one you've got, it's pretty significant. And the place was rebuilt. The schools, the church, the homes were rebuilt. They have a thriving community. Out of this challenge that Bishop Hannington gave them to these refugees who had nothing to give of what little they had, they were able to rebuild. And they said, one comment was really interesting, we used to give out of duty, but now we give out of joy because it changes our community. So in that first step of giving, giving of material stuff, the genius, it made a difference. It really changed the way things were for the better. So that's the measure. Second one of the Christmas story I want to look at is the shepherds. The shepherds didn't give money, they didn't give stuff, they gave time. The shepherds, in social terms, were the lowest there in the Israel because they couldn't take part, because of having to take care of the sheep all the time, they couldn't take part in the religious rituals. 
And so they had to hang out with the sheep, so they would kind of despise. But the angel, not despised by the angel, Gabriel came to them and told them that the Messiah has been born and you'll find him. He's wrapped up tightly, in, wrapped up in cloth, lying in a manger, so you'll know that for sure that's him. Very unusual. And so uh, then the whole angelic choir filled the sky, singing, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to men on whom his favor rests, people on whom his favor rests. And so the shepherds had this great line, I just love this line the shepherds have, let us go to Bethlehem to see this thing that the Lord has told us about. What a great idea, let us go. Give of our time. And so they gave of their time. And they saw the baby. And they worshipped. And they told people about it. The shepherds, because they had given of their time, were the first evangelists. They had the privilege of being the first ones to tell people about Jesus. These despised shepherds, giving of their time. And sometimes, a lot of the time, it's easier to give money than to give time. Patty was just, I hope you don't mind, Bobby, Bobby about this thing about you writing all those compassion letters. Patty, we, we sponsor some children through Compassion, which is a wonderful organization by which you can find a child in a really poor country and help them by supporting them to get through school. And part of the deal is you write to them. And Patty spent hours writing these letters, and it was a lot of time. It's easy to write a check. Got it written, put it in the envelope, off it goes. Writing these letters really took time, but it's going to bless those kids. When they hear, it's an actual building a relationship. It takes time. Love takes time. And so I want us to think, you to think of where you have given time recently. We've taken time out to be with family and friends at Thanksgiving. And how we were able to use that time to be a blessing. How you have recently or can give time to make an eternal difference in somebody's life by what you speak, by what you listen and hear, letting them speak their troubles out and come to a sense of peace and decision about how to deal with it simply because you took the time, the gift of time, which is in a way more precious than the first step of the ladder of genius, generosity, giving of stuff, giving of money, giving of time. Yeah, what have you invested that has eternal consequences? Moving up the ladder, we come to Joseph. Joseph was betrothed to Mary. A betrothal was a very serious, even more significant than um, uh, being engaged. Now, um, betrothal could only be ended by divorce or death of one of the parties. Joseph is betrothed. He and Mary are spending time apart, looking forward to the wedding. He finds out Mary's pregnant. And he's not the father. Now, for us, we know the story, we know the prophecy in Isaiah, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and you shall call his name Emmanuel, God is with us. Great. Joseph didn't know that. All he knew was that she was pregnant and he wasn't a dad. And so he decided first not to add any more shame to the existing shameful situation, but to divorce her quietly. But then, in a dream at night, an angel came and told him, Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife because the child that is born is, her, is of the Holy Spirit and he will be, I um, can't remember exactly, but uh, the point is you will call his name Jesus because he will save the people from their sins. And so Joseph went ahead and married Mary. People didn't know. People haven't had that dream. Joseph had had that dream. He knew that this was the Messiah. Other people didn't know. He looked like a fool. He looked like a cuckoo, you know? Your bride has a baby and you're not the dad. That's what it looked like to the rest of the world. In that fascinating novel, Christ the Lord Out of Egypt by Anne Rice, who used to write vampire stories, and then she came to know Christ and wrote some wonderful historical novels about Jesus. And you can see a hint of this in the Gospel according to John. Jesus was regarded as an Ill illegitimate child in this society where the standard practice, if the community had done what the law said, they would have stoned Mary to death. Providentially, of course, they didn't. God protected her. But that was the situation Joseph went into, looking like a fool, losing his reputation. Now, we don't often have that kind of challenge, but there's a saying 
It's amazing what you can get done if you don't mind who gets the credit. You know, it's amazing what you can get done if you don't mind who gets the credit. And some of us have a reputation as a leader in the church or in business or something in the city. A reputation as a doer or somebody. Do something for the Lord that nobody knows about. Not caring about your reputation. Doing something, I mean we do good things and we get credit for it and we like to honor people in church who do wonderful things to keep the amazing ministries that this church has going to serve the community of the world and that's great. And it's good to be honored. But my challenge, following Joseph's reputation, do something really neat to serve that's out of your regular line of business and that nobody knows about. So, Joseph, so we've seen beginning this letter with giving stuff in a way the easiest, though it is a challenge, then giving time, then reputation on the line, and then look at Mary. Mary gave up her future. Like any teenage girl, she was dreaming. She knew who she was going to marry. She was dreaming about how many children they'd have and what their life would be like, living a simple, quiet life together, these two who loved each other. And then Gabriel came to her and told her she was going to get pregnant. And her whole dreams and plans were erased by God's plan. And uh, yeah, she took Jesus, she and Joseph took Jesus to the temple to dedicate him. And while he was there, she met a, a prophet, Simeon. And Simeon blessed them. Yes, Simeon first took the baby in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, now dismiss your servant in peace, for mine eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. God had told Simeon that he was not going to die before he saw the Messiah, the promised one, the anointed one, who was going to come, the Savior. And Simeon was very old. He wondered, and then when Jesus came, he knew this was the Messiah. And Mary was the mother of the Messiah, which was wonderful. But it wasn't easy. Simeon went on. This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel, and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed, and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Mary, a sword will pierce your heart and your soul. It's not going to be easy. Bitterness mixed with the sweet. Her future was erased by the plan of God. And we have our dreams. I think I was mentioning in Sunday school, one of my dreams is to go back to Italy and in Tuscany and Umbria, visit the churches that have the beautiful pictures there. Okay, it may never happen. You know, people have their bucket list, the hundred things you're going to do before you die, all that kind of stuff, a hundred books to read, a thousand records to listen to, a hundred places to visit. Folks, we've got all eternity. If you don't get your bucket list done in this life, don't worry about it. Let God change your plans. Take that future which you've mapped out and do something really significant with it, as he did with Mary. Wiping out her future, giving her a life which wasn't easy, but which was hugely significant. And was a terrific blessing in the end, you know, that on the cross, as she was seeing her own son tortured to death, Jesus told John to take care of Mary, and she went with John. Her um, treating him as her son, him treating her as a mother. And he took care of her, and they lived um, to a right old age, as far as we know, in Ephesus. So it worked out okay, but it was tough, and it was not what she had planned. So the ladder of generosity from stuff which is a challenge, but which is the first step through time, reputation, the future, and then the greatest gift of all, Jesus. Looking at the child, the figure at the center of the Christmas story, we see Jesus there. And after he'd grown, Jesus knew what was in store, what his purpose to come to earth was. And he said, Mark 10, 45, he said, <clears throat> The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Mark 10, 45, very important verse. 
The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. The ultimate, giving one's life so that others may live. An interesting footnote to Bishop Hannington Bakemuka of Uganda, who taught these refugees who had nothing to give of what little they had and so doing changed and rebuilt a whole community which had been completely destroyed by war. His name, his first name, Hannington, was the name of an earlier Bishop Hannington in the 1870s, Bishop James Hannington from East Sussex in England who went to Uganda to bring the good news of Jesus to the people there. And he was stabbed to death. And as he was bleeding to death, Bishop James Hannington said, my blood has opened the door of Uganda for the gospel. And it worked. There have been terrible things. Idi Amin was a horrible dictator and the war was devastating. But Uganda has been dedicated as a nation to Christ and it is amazing. My nephew is a wildlife biologist for the BBC. We were with him staying for a night with him and hearing their stories when we were in England in October. And he had just come back from the Congo and Uganda filming chimpanzees. He has the kind of job, he gets paid to do what people pay thousands and thousands of dollars to do. He's a deep kid. And um, anyway, but he said it's like day and night. The Congo is awful. If you give somebody a tip, they'll go, yeah, is that all it is? Yeah. You know, you go to Uganda, give somebody a tip. Oh, thank you. Night and day. Ingratitude and violence to recovery and hope and gratitude. Bishop James Hamilton was martyred and he said, my blood opens the door for Christ to Uganda. And that's what Jesus did. He gave his life so that we can have life. He gave his life on the cross to pay the price for all the wrong we've ever done, to win the victory over death, to go through death and come out on the other side victorious, to do all of that for us, the greatest. And so the ladder of the genius of generosity from giving stuff which is a challenge, but it's the beginning through time, reputation, future, and life itself is the challenge God sets before us. And He has given us all of this, and we are His. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, this is the last Sunday of the month, and I hope my runner has his running shoes on. And if you have received a blessing, um, I, well, I would like.